15 years ago, Cy Swan and I got a commission to make about, oh, I think it was probably 40 feet of grill like this. And so we got to use a power hammer and sort of an open die forging operation. And we had to drill a couple thousand holes for rivets, like a lot of rivets. And I thought, man, I, I, how am I gonna drill 2,000 holes and live to tell the tale? And I thought, wow, I need a real drill press. And Cy says, well, why don't you get a radial drill? Good idea. Now, one of the reasons I love my wife so much is she supports me in getting tools. And I said, Kelly, would you watch Craigslist for something called a radial drill? Sure. I don't think it was two days later. She said, Scott, what's this? And here was this Arboga Maskiner radial drill in Springfield, Oregon, just up the road. And the price was, I think he wanted 3,500 bucks. I called him and it had two or three features that I knew were gonna make it just right for my shop if we could make the deal, and we made the deal. Let me show you how this thing works, the features it has, and let me ask you a ton of questions because I'm not a machinist and I'm counting on you guys to keep me from wrecking this thing now that it's been in the shop 15 years and probably needs some TLC. The first hurdle if you wanna add a machine tool, you know, a lathe or a milling machine or a radial drill, to a carpenter shop is you need three-phase power. I didn't have three-phase power, I had single-phase power, but a rotary three-phase converter, which is this little dusty monstrosity right here, will trick your single-phase electricity into three-phase, like this, three-phase power. Let me show you why this is called a radial drill. If I loosen this clamp, and loosen this clamp, two things can happen. I can rotate that quill a long ways so you can see how this would simplify getting over big pieces and I can raise it. Now this is not the way you push your quill through the work. This is the way that you raise your quill high enough to get into what you gotta drill or back down. Then once you come to the space or the place that you want it, in this attitude, you can clamp the turret, clamp the turret, and it gets very rigid. The other range of action is in and out. Now let me just point out that this thing started its productive life in a machine shop for Hewlett Packard. It went from there to a very tightly controlled high-end machinist in Springfield who buys and sells and makes and he does cool stuff. I don't remember his name. But that was a nice shop too and I just could hear this guy groan when I pulled it into my blacksmith shop, wheeled it into an area that's not climate controlled and just wished him good luck. He's holding up fine but he's not as pristine now as he was when I got him. So let me go from top to bottom to kind of talk about the things that make this so useful to me. So besides the fact that I can swing this thing all over the place, including clear away from the table, so if I wanna drill a hole in the end of a stump 40 inches tall, I can set it on the floor and drill the hole. Or if I have a piece of plate, steel, that I can clamp into my vise, I can drill a hole, you know, miles out here, handy. But the thing that makes this really useful for a guy that does blacksmith work and woodwork is this transmission. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different speeds that this thing can be operated at, depending on the orientation of these two gear shifts. For instance, right now, it is at this attitude and so if I turn this electrical switch to the one position, it turns 540 RPMs. And if I turn this to the number two position, it turns 1,085. That's cooking. And on the other end of the spectrum, if I change the gear shifts, to that condition, on the number two position, it turns 200 RPMs.
But for the really big holes or something that you don't want to burn or have any problem with, you can turn it down as low as 100 RPMs. Look at that. That's what you call irresistible force. So clearly you wouldn't try to slow a 3 16 bit down to 100 RPM, but you might want to slow an inch and a half bit down to 100 RPM. Now this is actually an inch and 21 64ths. 32 64ths would be a half an inch, but this is approaching the maximum size that this drill is supposed to spin, supposed to drill in steel. The book says that an inch and a half is the top, top hole diameter you should try. But I think if a guy used pilots and a progressive increase in the size of the hole, you could probably crowd through a little bigger hole than that if you wanted. So this is a Jacobs chuck. I don't know the history on a Jacobs chuck. I can't tell you why it's such a wonderful invention and you know, just the handiest thing that you gotta have. But I can tell you that it works for kind of a standard assortment of bits. It'll go up, I think this is a 5 eighths Jacobs chuck. And it'll take, you know, up to a pretty good sized bit. And everybody's familiar with that. You just put the chuck key in there and you loosen it up and works great. But obviously that is not going to work for a bit like this or like we were just talking about, a bit like this. To do that, you use the Morris taper chuck that comes as the standard integral attachment point for this drill. And you do it like this. I run the quill down and I look right through this little aperture right here, right through that hole, and I can see daylight through there. I take this drift, just a tapered piece of steel, I put it in there, this is a thing where you don't have quite enough hands. And I take a lead hammer because it's not good to jar a machine tool much. And that Jacob's chuck just comes right out. This is the Morris taper point of attachment. I think it's a number four Morris taper. You guys can straighten me out on that. There's a whole encyclopedia of information pertaining to this that I don't have at my disposal. You can feel it lodge up into that slot. I bring it out, take my lead hammer, jar, 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 jar. Lead doesn't bother the steel. And now that will turn as slow. Got nothing to grab a hold of there. Probably not good practice anyway, and never do that with gloves on, by the way. Or I can speed this up. Let's turn this up to about, oh, let's go 355 RPMs. Probably not a bad speed for a three quarter inch bit. Now this whole Morris taper technology, you ought to learn some more about that and so should I. But it is the way that machine tools are one of the big ways that machine tools are often connected to their cutting bits. There are three different sizes of Morris taper right there. I think this is a four, I think this is a three, I think this is a two, but you guys can educate me on that. There are, there are two or three different types of tapers, and I'm not even gonna try to imagine or make up what those are, but they use just the friction along that whole long taper and that little spline to get a more positive connection. But the beauty of this system is that with a little tool like this, somebody tell me what this is called, will you? You can remove these adapters, see that? Now those two are the same size-ish. Or I can remove this one. It hasn't been pulled off in a long time. And it'll adapt down to this one. So it becomes kind of an interchangeable range of attachments. So you can use bits from half inch which I also have in spades for the Jacobs chuck or all the way up to the big bad boys. Morris taper is its own really large field of arcane machinist knowledge that you guys can put in the comments because we're all curious and most of us don't know. All right, so before I dive into this 
bench or the knee or this table, which was the big reason I decided to buy this drill, and this vise that came from a big old shaper, Cy found it for me, and I just appreciate it so much because it really makes this tool. I just want to demonstrate the power feed feature, which is a moneymaker sometimes. I'm going to put this uh, 13 sixteenths And you turn it until you feel it engage with that slot up there right now. And I go tap, 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 tap with the lead hammer. I'm going to raise this up a little bit, loosen that clamp, raise it up. And then being a carpenter at heart, I'm going to put this four by four in here, tighten up the vise. Second time I use this, I almost wrecked my new machine. I had the handle in like that, which is wrong, and it came tight about like this, and I tried to lower the turret, and the turret came down right there, just like this started to come down here, and I wasn't watching, but I got off the trigger before anything broke. But I learned right then that when you're lowering that turret, you make sure you don't have any interference. Let me show you how this power feed works. Loosen that, push it back over there, we'll go to the middle. I'm just going to arbitrarily pick a spot about like that. I'm going to lock the turret in both places. We're going to run it down. Yes, I like it. This little I'll call it a lever, bail right here, and it initiates a power feed. I'm going to turn the speed up to about 700. It's going to be cooking. Watch this. By hand, engage the power feed, and there it goes. Hands-free operation. That's really nice on steel because you don't get an uneven cut like you can by hand and then you can interrupt it right here now let me just point something out this is a stop that will enable you to set the depth of the hole you drill but I've lost the nifty little lever that's supposed to go in there I've got to look around and hit this thing and see if I can find it you can see how gentle I am on my equipment but anyway the idea is that you can initiate this power feed until it will automatically shut itself off. That's both handy and dangerous. I mentioned that this knee is adjustable. It's really nice. So you just loosen that, which is the clamp, and then it's got a worm. So you can rock this thing around either direction and it is nicely indicated right here. You can bring it right down to whatever. There we go. Actually, it's nicely indicated right there. So we're coming up on 10 degrees right there. Now that's handy. A drill bit doesn't like to drill in at an angle, but if you put an end mill on there, at least I think that's what they're called, this thing will hold, will chuck up, will present an end mill so you can drill an angled hole in a piece of steel and I've used that four or five different times, four or five different jobs and each time I think, thank you Kelly for finding me exactly the right radial drill for this little shop. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0 degrees. Back to 90. All right, so I have some questions to ask you guys about lubrication, about oiling fittings. And then I just want to point out that when I saw this thing, I knew it was a one because it's the right size. So Cy has one probably twice the size of this. And I've got a friend, Doc Goldberg, who has one three times the size of this. But this is perfect for my shop. The footprint is not huge. The range of action is sufficient. The quality is good. So if I, was, if I had a magic wand and if I knew how to use it, I would have the power feed feature 
tied to the manual operation of the quill like it is on size and on a lot of them, where when you grab the quill to operate it, you simply fold the handles over towards you and the power feed's initiated. I've got to take this and do that. Wow, that's a first world problem. But what I need from you guys, besides the criticism of having not kept this thing clean, I mean, I would need a tarp over it, right? How in the world do I get the oil into these little fittings that have that ball bearing detent in there? I've got this tip, but when I push that in there, the ball, bearing, the ball itself blocks the aperture on that, and I don't think there's any oil getting in where it goes. All I do is create more of a mess on the outside. I've tried holding it in with a, with a center punch. I don't, I don't know. Where would I get the fitting that would actually get oil in there? I'm afraid that I'm dry on the inside. There's a little oil cup right here. I understand that. It's lost its lid. I can do that. And I know I'm getting some in there. But as far as getting it inside, throw these things, I don't know, I've just about given up. So this machine is rated to drill up to an inch and a half hole. This is inch and, inch and three eighths. Watch the torque this has. Now I don't, I never try to push a big bit like this through a piece without a pilot. So I put a half inch pilot in there. Let's see how it does. I'm gonna turn it down to 100 RPMs. That's some serious torque. A little low on oil. Getting hot. See if we're going to make it. There we go. And right here, power feed becomes important as you're coming through the last part of the cut. Now, the number of ways I was doing that wrong probably won't fit into the comment section, but we're all ears. And if you guys can stop some of the other guys that are watching this from making the same mistakes that I make all the time, It'll help them, and you better believe that I'm gonna read what you tell me and it'll help me also. So there's two big aspects of this that I haven't taken the time because I don't have the expertise to get going. And one is there's a coolant pump. That's the switch for it right there. Ideally, there's a nozzle spraying coolant over something like this. It runs down through this trough, returns back to the pump, and just circulates. I haven't done that. And the other one is it's as simple as a light. There's a light that's integral with this whole thing that I haven't energized, you would have to step the power down from whatever runs a three-phase motor to whatever would run a 60-watt <laughs> light bulb. I haven't done that. But in spite of all that, we did get the 2,000 holes drilled. It has done everything else that I've needed for the last 15 years. And I hope, I hope, that this little machine outlasts me. I've been using straight 20-weight non-detergent. Seems about right. I don't know if it is or not, but I know there are people out there that do know so please enlighten me. In general, let me know what I should do better than just keep it alive. Although at this point, I count myself somewhat lucky to have kept it alive. But if it were to quit me, I don't know what I would do. It's one of those tools where I only use it about four times a month. But if I didn't have it, I think I would just give up and go home. Thanks for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.